Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well in this beautiful morning. We're excited that you're joining us out here for a City of Davis virtual wetland tour. Getting started right on time. We're gonna give people a moment to all be admitted in. Well, you can see behind me here that we're standing out here in the beautiful city of Davis wetlands. My name is Sabrina Britt. I'm the volunteer coordinator with Yolo Basin Foundation, which you see across my shirt there. Yolo Basin Foundation is the educational nonprofit that provides educational opportunities for our community in the greater Sacramento area, all about the Yolo Bypass wildlife area. So our mission is to expand public appreciation and stewardship of wetlands and wildlife throughout the Yolo Basin, which is a much bigger area that floods, uh, that used to flood naturally, through education and partnerships. And we have a partnership with the City of Davis Wetlands to provide educational opportunities out in these local wetlands as well. So we um, monthly, uh, on the first Saturday of each month throughout most of the year, except for the summer, we provide um, tours of the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area, which you can see a map of there. And then um, on the second Saturday of every month, we provide tours of the City of Davis wetlands, which we're out at today. Now through this time, we've been doing virtual tours and that's what you're here for today. So thank you so much for joining us from home. And I'm excited to announce that our tours are making a comeback as being in person once again. Um, they are still free to our community, just as these virtual tours have been. And in the past, the in-person walking tours and driving tours have been free. So they still are for you. We appreciate your support um, in participating and also with the donations that you send in to support the programs that we can provide to our community. So thank you all so much for joining us and supporting what we do. We're so happy to bring these opportunities to you. So we will have throughout the summer, um, uh, our in-person tours of the City of Davis Wetlands. And you can also uh, come out here on your own. Um, this area is open to the public from um, 7 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. daily. So Sunday to Sunday right now. That does change at other parts of the year because there are other stakeholders that use this area, uh, such as hunters, when it is uh, a specific hunting seasons that are allotted out here, for example. So this place is open to you. Uh, when we do the in-person tours, they are driving tours. And I'm going to come off to this side here and kind of show you what's around me. So when you um, come to the City of Davis wastewater treatment plant, and we do have a map that does show that, um, that's the entrance right near there, just, uh, just north of Mace Boulevard and 2nd Street. You just drive north. I think it's county, I think the road is, uh, you might see it on the map there. I'm, I'm a visual driver, so I forget road numbers and names. <laughs> but you'll see it there. I think it's just up County Road 102, I think, I believe. Let me check here for you. And it's just north of the, what's that? 105. Thank you, 105. There's my dyslexia, I flipped the two. <laughs> Um, so you just drive north on that and you get to the wastewater treatment plant and you enter through a gate, again, open from seven to one, and you just drive straight down that gravel road. You'll come to a gated area and that makes the road will make you veer left and then a slight right as you come down that little hill. And then you drive out into the area that we are in right now. You pass farm farm fields where they can farm rice out here. Um, those get flooded up at the right time of year to grow rice. Um, they keep it about five to six inches of water to grow rice. And you continue to drive out here and you can kind of see on my screen here where we're at. We are actually just southeast of the entrance to the city of Davis wetlands. You can see that there. Okay. Now there is, um, behind me, you can see there's a little bridge here. 
Um, there are little, there are areas that are flattened um, and typically maintained to keep the grass low so that you can park and walk. Um, there are some areas that you can walk out here. Um, and then there's also a really nice uh, driving auto tour loop that you can access when you enter the wetlands. Um, and so we are off on one of the service roads right now, but just, just behind me, um, you can see a couple of, there's a couple of willow trees and the, there's the big willow tree up right behind me right here. And then there's a little willow tree over that way in the distance. And right over there is the auto tour route. And the tour route takes you around to um, the east and then down south. So I'm facing south right now. Um, and back up and around. Um, and when I drove it just a couple weeks ago, I uh, saw a nice um, large buck out there in the, in the wildlife area out here. So it was really, really neat to see that. So today we're gonna take a close look at what's out here today with us. It's warming up out here. There's not a lot of water in the channels behind us. You can see it's pretty dry. There's a lot of cattail and tule behind me, but it provides a lot of habitat out here. And speaking of habitat, that's why this place is here. So the city of Davis works with the Save Davis Wastewater Treatment Plant, and that water is treated and recycled or reused, pumped back out into these wetlands so that uh, we can provide more habitat for wildlife. Um, and we'll take a close look at some of the things we have out here. I have uh, Liz Johnson, one of our volunteers at home, who will be moderating your questions. So throughout our time together, we're looking at the scope feed, that Nancy will be providing to us a live scope feed, which has been a key component of our tours. Um, if you have questions during that time, just send them in in your chat feature. Um, at the top or the bottom, you'll have a little toolbar in your Zoom screen and find chat. There's a little chat bubble and click that and you're gonna select to send it to moderator for questions. And that's Liz at home. She'll uh, take your questions. She'll feed them to me in the last 10 to 15 minutes of our time together. She can read off your questions to me. I'd be happy to answer those for you. Um, Nancy is here. I mentioned that with our live scope feed. And so we'll be toggling back and forth a little bit between the scope for you to see what's here um, and me talking. And I have some other items to share with you as well. But I know you want to see what's here more so than my face. So let's get looking at the scope. All right. So I'm going to come off to the side here for you. I am our tour guide and videographer today. So I'm uh, multitasking for you all out here. And we're gonna, you're seeing me up close for a moment and we're gonna make sure that we spotlight that scope so that you guys can see that really, really well. Okay, let's see what's out here. All right, so coming into focus on our scope is a double crested cormorant. Now that is a water bird. That bird does have webbing on its feet, much like waterfowl do. However, it's not a waterfowl because it doesn't have the same body structure. It doesn't have that short football shaped or fusiform shape to its body. It's more elongated. And right now we saw in the scope that the bird is sitting on the branches in a tree and it's just hanging out, it's just resting. But at times, like this image here, we see them stretch out their wings nice and wide, and that's for thermoregulation. So that's them warming up or cooling down so that the, the temperature is regulated in their body. So their wings are able to get warmth from the sun and help with that or if they're kind of airing out or drying off and there's cool air that's surrounding those wings, then the blood flow right under each of the shafts of the wings in their skin is cooling down in that way too. So our cormorant is up there. It looks like it's preening now a little bit. So it's reaching back and possibly picking little things out of its feathers, possibly spreading oil across its feathers to keep its wings dry. So like waterfowl, the cormorants have a uropigial gland and that gland is just near its rump, just above its rump along its back. And that gland produces an oil. They'll use that oil and spread that around their wings and their feathers to keep themselves dry. 
So we see it doing some preening there for that. So it's not thermoregulating right now, might do that later. It's, it's warming up out here pretty fast. So we maybe we'll catch it spreading its wings some later too. Yeah. So our scope's gonna take a look around for some other things for you all. And while we take a look around, I can show you something that we saw on our way out here today. So excuse me, I'm just gonna step off to the side and grab this. As we drove out here, so you just saw a cormorant, the double-crested cormorant as a water bird. But as we drove out here, we saw a couple of pheasants that were hunkering down in the grass, some male pheasants. And those are upland birds that use the grasslands around here. And here's an example of a pheasant wing. Now I'm right in the sunlight, so I'm gonna bring this a little closer here and see if you can see some of that iridescence that the wing has. Beautiful coloration and patterns. That iridescence is to attract females, to find a mate. And the patterns, the different um, stripings, the different splotches, the different colors also help with camouflage. And a really neat behavior that I saw is when we drove out here, we could see um, the, the male pheasants they have a very bright green head and that's pretty visible to the females during mating season here in the spring, but they, they hunker down. They bring their head lower in the grass and they hide, which is really, really neat. So I'm getting closer. We're gonna take a look over at what's going on on our scope. Okay, let's see what we're seeing over there. Okay, you can see both of us on there. And we're still taking a look. We're gonna keep scanning for you and see what else is there. Now, the, um, the cormorant that we saw being a water bird is eating small fish in the water. And the pheasants though, they're eating something completely different. They're eating bugs that are in the ground, on top of the ground or under the dirt so that they can find the insects of their cho choosing. The cormorants um, are actually using their bills to also get some of the, the seeds in the water. So they will eat both. Um, and then also they're omnivores. And then our um, upland birds, um, our pheasants, have that in common with them. Even though they're very different groups of birds and families, they have some similarities, right? So our pheasants are uh, omnivores too, and they'll eat the seeds that are within the grasslands and the upland areas, um, but then also insects that are hiding at the roots of the grasses um, and the plants and in the dirt. Now, a really neat thing about the upland birds is that, or especially the, the pheasant, is that they are dimorphic, just like waterfowl. Um, well, ducks, I should say, not all waterfowl are dimorphic, um, but ducks and pheasants have that in common. Dimorphism means that the male and the female come in different colorations and shades. So you can easily tell them apart. It makes it easy for us, that helps us so much as bird watchers, or hunters, people that are new to get out here and say, oh, I can see a difference between these birds. Are they different species? Are they male or female? So the dimorphism between the male and female really helps with identification purposes because you can tell them apart, the male and the female. Um, and in the bird world, a lot of times the females tend to be a little bit bigger than the males, but then the males, if they have dimorphism, the males are the more colorful ones. And that's really because the males have to attract the female and distract predators away from them. So another feature of this iridescent wing is that it's going to distract predators. So coyote that are out here, they're going to see that and get distracted. And then it pulls the coyote away from the nesting female, for example. So it distracts the predator and lures it away. Now come after the male. Now the cormorant that we saw earlier, the cormorants don't have dimorphism. So the males and the females look pretty much the same. It's hard to tell them apart. There are just like subtle differences around the bill. 
Um, so, and then just in size, but it's a slight difference. So it can be challenging to tell them apart from one another. Okay. So while we're looking for some other items in the scope, I'd love to share with you some of that dimorphism that we find in um, the ducks that we're seeing. How we do, we are seeing mallards out here, mallard ducks. And here you can see, I'll bring that nice and close to the camera. So you can see the iridescence on the scapular part of the wing. And it looks like we have, I'm gonna go back over to our spotting scope for you here because we've got something in there. Here we go, we've got a, a Canada goose. So there's a type of waterfowl that is not dimorphic like our mallard is that I was just showing you. Um, the, males and, the male and female Canada geese look exactly the same. Just a slight difference in size. So we would call them monomorphic where the male and the female look exactly the same. But you can see here to tell the Canada geese apart from other geese, you can see that a very distinct white chin strap that it has. And then along its nape down to its breast, just at the top of the breast is there's that nice black color. And then the crown is all black. And they have that nice black bill. At the breast, it's all white feathers. And along their belly, so lighter brown. Oh, there's another one. So that could that could be a, a mating pair there. Yeah, looks like it is. Right. And waterfowl such as these, they, they pair up in late uh, winter. So kind of towards the end of December and January, they start to, to pair up. Um, and uh, Canada geese, a lot of geese and the swans, they mate for life. Whereas ducks, like the mallard duckwing I was just showing you with that purple iridescence on its scapular, um, those are more promiscuous. We are seeing um, our Canada geese just kind of stroll through the water there. That's just relaxing and swimming slowly. They have very large black webbed feet in order to push very easily through the water. So their, their feet are very hydrodynamic. Okay, let's see what we've got here in our scope. We also have an American coot. And you can see this bird moves its neck very much like a chicken. And that's because genetically they are fairly closely related to chickens. Um, they're, all, they're part of the rail family. Um, but uh, when we classified animals just looking at their phylogeny, their physical appearances, we grouped these with rails. We're bringing up a picture here of our coot. You can see it a bit closer. Um, but now that we do a lot more genetic testing and taking a look at genomes of animals, we have discovered that genetically they're more closely related to chickens. Um, and they can also be called the chicken-like birds of the marsh. <laughs> There's our Canada geese again. The coot has a very different foot than our Canada geese. So that's why we see the coot moving its nape, its neck back and forth in the water like a rudder to help it swim because their feet are not webbed. They have lobed toes. We're bringing up a picture of that for you to see there. So you see their, their toes um, have space between them. So it's not fully webbed. This is partial webbing. Those lobes are those skin flaps that kind of um, curve out down their toe. They have three of them on each toe. Those do help them swim, but they're not as hydrodynamic as the fully webbed feet. Okay, we're gonna pull up some things in the scope there. There we go, we've got our Canada geese again. So we've got one that's just resting. You'll see that it has its head turned back and it kind of tucks its bill into the tops of its feathers, into the coverts of its feathers and into the body feathers on its back so that it can rest. And we've got our other Canada goose just hanging out nearby, close by in the water, just paddling nearby. 
So while we move the scope around and we check out what else is out here, I can show you, let's see, I can show you that wing again of the, of the mallard that we were looking at. You can see that there. So this is that dimorphism that ducks have, but our Canada geese and our swans and the waterfowl family do not. Now I'm hearing lots of noise out here, but you might not be hearing that. So I have um, something, a great feature on my phone that you can get to. It's from the Cornell Labs of Ornithology. It's called the Merlin Bird app. And it's free for you to download and use. And you can listen to different calls. So because we're virtual and you're out here, you can't hear a lot of the sounds that we're hearing, which is, which is a huge part of experiencing the wetlands. There's just this cacophony of music from the animals out here. It's just incredible. So I'd like to bring some of that home to you and I'll have you listen to the Canada goose. So we just saw that, that pair. So I'll pull that up on my phone here so you can hear that, what they sound like. <laughs> So those are pair calls. Those are the male and female calling together. And then there are other calls so I'd love to share. We're hearing some flight calls to you out here. I'm going to take a peek at what's going on on our scope over here for you. And I can play another sound of those Canada geese for you too. Looks like we're almost finding something there in the scope again. And here's another call of the Canada geese. <laughs> So great, their, their, their nickname is honkers um, and you can tell why, right? They sound like honking horns. We've got something on the scope here that's in our habitat in the Thule. So we're gonna bring up the scope. One moment for me there. Thanks for your patience. There we go. Let's take a look here. What do we have there? We have a black crowned night heron. Now this is a type of wading bird we do find these birds out here a lot, hunkering down in the Thule just like this. We can see huge groups out here of up to like 50 to 70 of them. Um, and these are just rookeries, just rest sites for them. And let's see if I can pull up a sound here of our black crowned night heron. You can see it's just hanging out. But being a wading bird, they have very long legs. There's a good picture of them. Now this one is a smaller um, heron compared to like the great blue heron um, or the great egrets. So they still have long legs for their body in proportion to their body, um, but they are still able to wade just in shallower waters than those larger herons. And they are feeding on um, items that are in the water. They can eat small crayfish, they can eat frogs, tadpoles. Uh, they, will, they will also eat things in the grasses, um, but they, they prefer mostly stuff in the water, but they can eat stuff along the edge of the grasses um, and the tule plants there. So how to identify the black crown night here and there is on its crown, it's, it's got the black, that's where it gets its name, right? And then under the chin and along the face, um, it's around the eye, it's very white and down across the, the, um, the throat and down to its breast, it's white. It's got gray and black coloration, a little bit of purple iridescence on the wings that can be really hard to see though. Um, and it has a long uh, yellow bill for it to feed in the water. And it has a, a black eye strap that goes over its eye there that you can see fairly well there. It just turned a little more, so that helps us to see it some more. And we're going to see if we can find the sound from our black-crowned night heron. 
Here we go. Okay, so they have um, a variety of different calls. That is one type of call. Here's another one. Okay, here's another one for you. So more of a warning call. And then the other ones, the other ones are just speaking to each other, communicating with each other, if possibly about food, possibly about mates. Um, I don't have any of their mating calls on here, unfortunately, though. that would be great to have as well. So we can see it's just resting there in the Thule. The Thule provides a lot of habitat for birds. It's a great place for them to hide, to camouflage in. And I was going to mention before that the, that the patterns on the um, pheasant, the ring-necked pheasant wing that we looked at, and the patterns on these other birds that are hiding in the tule, for example, like the black crowned night heron, help them to break, it breaks up their their body shape and structure. So you can see we kind of pulled out of the, the scope so you can see how well it hides. So it kind of, it helps them to, to blend in. Um, and animals all over the world do this. Their patterns break up the shape of their body so that a predator or even a prey can't identify what it is. It's very confusing to the eye. Um, and you definitely find that on uh, you know, animals in Africa, like hyenas and cheetahs that have just these crazy cool patterns and splotches and um, spots and lines on their body. So it's pretty amazing. So we'll, we'll let Nancy take a look around um, some more with the, with the scope um, while I show you um, one of the red winged blackbird wings that we have out here. So there are a lot of red-winged blackbirds that we see out here, and there's a wing. You see that okay there? Get a little closer for you to see that. Um, they're hard to catch on the scope as they're, they are a songbird, and they're, they're quicker, um, to, and they move around a lot. But when you come out here on your own or as part of a walking tour, um, we can see them solitary, hanging out on their own at the tips of the tule. And there you can see one sitting there. Thank you, Liz, for that picture. Um, but we can also see them in large flocks because they use the tule out here for uh, rookeries like the, the black crowned night heron was for resting and also for nesting sites. And they tend to come back to the same areas to nest uh, year after year. Um, occasionally they'll move. Um, so this is a great place around here. Um, just north of us, there's, uh, just northeast of us, there's uh, Conaway Ranch, uh, where they get a lot of um, tricolored blackbirds and uh, uh, the yellow, yellow colored blackbirds, uh, red, yellow winged, there we go, sorry, and the red winged blackbirds as well. And you can see all of those out here too. Um, so Save Davis Wetlands and Conaway Ranch are great places to see that. Um, out in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area, we also see a lot of uh, red-winged blackbirds, uh, as well as brewer's blackbirds, which are all um, black to dark brown in color and smaller in size. Um, so that's how you can kind of identify the two brewers and the red-winged blackbirds. The tricolored birds have the kind of a red and orangey yellow coloration to their wing. And then, of course, the yellow-winged blackbirds have yellow. Um, and you can hear them out here as well. They're very vocal. I'm going to show you a nest here of a tricolored blackbird. Let's see if you can see this well here. I'm going to bring it around to the side and kind of tilt the camera down so you can see that really well. All right. So sorry, I know my face gets close there as I switch the camera. So let's see if you can see that really well, see that better. So these are examples of 
tricolored blackbird nests, which do look very similar to the other blackbird nests that we find out here. And this is nesting season, it's warming up. They've started a bit early. The seasons are changing, our climate is changing. So we're seeing differences. And when animals start to return to places in migrations, um, and also in nesting. Nesting has been moved up for them as it has gotten warmer earlier. Yeah, so you can see that. And they use, um, they use the cattail. And uh, you can see right here, it's nice and clear that cattail plants are very flat. They're more rectangular. Whereas tule plants are very round. That's one way to tell them apart. Um, the cattail, I can show you what that looks like. I'm gonna flip you guys around again so you can see the cattail that they use to make their nests. So I've just stepped away to grab some supplies for you guys. So here you are, there's, um, there's our cattail. Right, and it's got about 250,000 seed pods on it. We are seeing something in, see, are we seeing something in this scope, Nancy? Feel free to chime in for me. Not, not yet, it looks like. But we have the cattail here. So this is very important for nest building for blackbirds, like you saw. Um, excuse me, and uh, it's a bit more rounded here at the top, right? and then it grows out very flat. There's some behind me, you can see there's cattail, which are very broad. Oh, there is a little marsh wren. I don't know if you can see that behind me. There's a little marsh wren fluttering around behind me. I think it just flew away. Oh. I have a great it's blue heron it's here. Coming up and down. Thank you, Nancy. It's kind of coming up and down, um, and we'll switch over to the scope. But the, the cattails that these birds out here are using, give me one moment, here we go. I um, have about 250,000 seeds and they spread by wind. And their blades are very important for nest building. So here we go, what are we seeing in the scope? I have a great blue heron and it is preening its feathers. You can see that that's a very large bird, right? They're one of our largest out here. They are a wading bird. They're related to the black crown night here. And we saw there goes a Canada goose paddling by. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Liz is bringing up a picture, a little more close up view of our great blue heron. Now they have that bluish grayish color. They're large, they're almost about five feet, um, but they don't weigh very much, just a few pounds. Because being a bird, they have hollow bones. Their bones are extremely light. That's one of the characteristics they need to have to be able to fly. So often when working with youth, we, we always get the fun question about, well, you know, I wish I could fly. If I had wings, I could fly, right? And there's so much more to flying besides just wings. They have hollow bones, air pockets in them that make them light so they can get off the ground. If they're heavy, if they had solid bones like us, there's no way they'd make it off the ground. I've got some coots that were swimming by in the background there. So this is a large bird, but doesn't weigh very much. So it's preening, it's, uh, it looks like it's preening it. Sorry, I have to get a little close to the camera. I've got the sunlight glare on there. For me to see the scope, you can probably see it better than me from home. It is preening its nape and its chest feathers. There, it's fluffing them out. You can see that wind blowing in it. And it's probably cooling it down. It's sitting still. They have those really long legs. You can see how high up it's standing, right? In that shallow water, those long black legs in order to wade out into deeper waters to catch crayfish. They can eat larger crayfish than like a, a night heron would since they're smaller. Um, a smaller beak, um, smaller throat on our night heron too. Um, and they just swallow them whole. They just pick them up and kind of kick them up in the air. I'm almost like if you're throwing popcorn up in the air and catching it in your mouth, they'll do that. Um, these birds will uh, 
eat fish out here in the water. They will eat, um, they can eat baby turtles. <laughs> um, they will eat, um, they can even eat some small uh, baby ducks, <laughs> some ducklings. Uh, they'll feed in the upland part as well, right along the water's edge. They can feed on snakes out here. Uh, we don't get any venomous snakes out here that they have to worry about or that we have to worry about, but they can feed on the small constrictors that we have out here, such as um, king snakes and garter snakes. Um, typically, they'll get garter snakes because they're close to the water, the California Valley garter snakes. They're closer to the water. They're good swimmers, where um, the king snakes can be in the upper part of the grasslands further away from the water, but those do get bigger than California garter snakes. So. Um, our great blue heron can eat garter snakes. Um, they will eat voles, uh, moles, shrews um, that are digging holes uh, in the ground in our uplands along the water's edge that are hiding in the grasses. Um, so the, the, the tule and the cattail out here are not only providing habitat to the birds that we're seeing today, but for a wealth of um, mammals out here too. Um, we did see an otter earlier today um, that popped its head up. So you can see otters out here too. Um, the otters can you know, scare off some of these birds that we're seeing here. And we do see a lot of hawks out here. Uh, right now, the Swainson hawks are, um, have migrated here and it's their nesting season. They have a, a small migration. Uh, route that they take, and uh, we're starting to see some, some nesting sites. Uh, I know with the expansion um, work that will be done on the Yolo Causeway that Swainson Hawk nests are being monitored around that area by Caltrans, um, and other environmental consulting companies are helping with that um, so that we can protect the Swainson's Hawk. They are a protected species. And here you can tell the difference between them and red-tailed hawks, which we also see out here. Um, these birds um, will, will scare up uh, the ducks and the herons that are out here in the water as they fly over looking for food. Um, and we also get northern harriers out here. So you can see kind of the, the color differences between them. I'm gonna pull up some sounds for you since we're still looking here and watching and observing our beautiful great blue heron preening itself. Let me see if I can get some great sounds for you from the Merlin app. Thanks for your patience. I'll just give you a quiet moment too to, to watch that bird. Oh, look, it turned its head nicely. I'll give you a quiet moment. did turn its head there for a moment. We got to see that nice eye stripe over its eye. Yeah, let's see, I do have a sound here for a great blue heron, so let's take a look. So we have a few different calls for them. The first one I'm gonna play is their display sound. So that's when the male is, oops, let me pause that one. That's when our um, male is displaying for the female and they do a little bit of a dance, some movements to show off and they spread out those wings um, so that the female can see how large and strong they are and choose them to be a mate. Um, here is the call, the chick calls of the great blue heron. And you can hear that different call there of the chicks. Um, and this is the time of year when you might start to see some chicks uh, driving up uh, to the wetlands uh, from 
Childs Road coming up 105. Uh, there's quite a bit of farmland and I saw lots of great egrets and snowy egrets that are also in that family with our great blue herons, our wading bird family. They were out there feeding in the agricultural lands, um, eating crop pests. That's why we love these natural, the natural wildlife. They help us control that too. While they were out there, I saw a few great egret chicks. Oh, they're so cute. They're all gray and kind of fluffy. So, you know, on your drive, even here, you can see some amazing wildlife, which is so cool. I love that we're getting a great look at this great blue heron. Sabrina, we had a question about what, yes. what is the bird, that blackbird uh, in the foreground? Uh, to the... It's off to the left? Yes. It looks like a cormorant. Yeah, there are, there's a group, there are some cormorants there. Thank there you. There are several of them. Mm -hmm. Several of them just resting on that island. We did get to see one of those earlier. Uh, Liz, do you want to pull up that photo again of the thermoregulating cormorant just yes. to get a closer look at that bird. They're pretty dark out there, right? So it's hard to see a lot of the details. So if we pull up that picture, that might help people see that again. Um, but they're just resting out there. They're just kind of hanging out. Just a handful of them. Here comes that picture. So it's the double crested cormorant. You can see it better there. You can see a close up of its eyes, the dark black eyes. You can see that coloration on the bottom of their beak and on their uh, chin. That helps you tell them apart. Double crested. So if you look at the, the, the head, right? Um, if you look at the crown, you can see a little bit of some feather, like little tufts coming out off the top of their head. So that's along the crest of their head, right? So near the crown. So it's, that's why it's double crested cormorant. Um, that's the type of cormorant we see out here in the freshwater wetlands. Um, here it's freshwater, here it's you know that recycled wastewater that is helping to provide habitat out here. Uh, out of the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area, we have a mix of, of uh, three different types of uh, wetlands. So we've got, um, well, we have temporary and seasonal wetlands, which are a bigger picture. Um, and then we also have out there, uh, we have tidal wetlands, we have um, some salt wetlands as we get towards into the delta, towards the end um, of the bypass. Uh, and then we also have the freshwater. Um, so saltwater, I guess brackish, I should say brackish, the mix of the tidal influence coming in and up through the delta. It, it can reach and inundate up further and, cre and create brackish water, which is a mix of salt and fresh. And so these are the cormorants we see in our freshwater marshes, but if you go out towards the coast, you can see other species of cormorants that are, that are seabirds. So cormorants are often referred to as a type of seabird, but these ones come inland. Uh, we also saw a bunch of pelicans out here. Um, just to highlight those two, um, if Liz, you want to bring up a, that picture of the American white pelicans. We, unfortunately, of course, things move around it here. We never know what we're gonna find. Um, so it's always an adventure um, and it's exciting to come out here and explore. Uh, so this morning we saw a pretty good sized group of American white pelicans and they were just kind of relaxing and hanging out. <laughs> Much of, that's kind of the behavior we're seeing out here a lot today. I think because it's warm, so things are just kind of resting, um, but the American white pelicans are one of those um, more, more of like a seabird that comes further inland to feed in brackish water and freshwater environments. Um, they have a very large stretchy pouch under their bill that allows them to hold up to 18 gallons of water with fish in that at a time. And then they put tilt their head back and swallow this fish whole. Um, the cormorants do that too, but they, they don't have um, such a big pouch, right? It's very, it's a smaller, very small pouch um, that they can scoop fish in. So the pelicans are just incredible that they have the adaptation to take in so much water and so much fish at a time. Uh, kind of makes me think of whales and how they can bring in so much into their mouth at a time. Um, the American white pelicans are all white, but they have black wing tips and they're fun to watch soaring through the air. They're just incredible because they ride the thermoclines in the air. 
So the warm air currents, right? Warm air rises um, and they just ride them and they soar. They, they really barely flap. Um, and they also use different formations, much like geese do to fly, uh, to help with that. Um, that is a technique that bir some birds use to decrease the amount of effort um, and energy it takes to fly. So they'll fly in formation and ride air currents to reduce that effort of flight, which is pretty incredible to see them do that. So it is um, about, we have about 10 to 14 minutes left in our total time together. So I'd love to be able to take some more of your questions. Are there more questions? Sabrina, we had a question about how much fluid the pelican can hold in its, um, its Right, so it can it can hold. Studies have shown that around eighteen gallons of water. It's a lot. <laughs> so think about a gallon of milk. Think of eighteen of those that it can scoop up, and that pouch just really stretches out. They don't hold that water in there for long, but then they push that water out with their muscles in their throat, um, around their larynx, so that they push the water out and then they can get just the fish to eat. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, any other questions? We had another question. Uh, one of our participants missed the first part of the talk. They wanted to know if it's possible to visit and walk around. So yes, um, so the City of Davis wetlands are currently open um, every day from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we are also getting back into in-person tours, um, which for City of Davis, we do those the second Saturday of each month. Um, our, our first tour of the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area is full. I think the first, and that's, that's in May, that's uh, coming up here, May 8th. Um, and then those drop off and throughout the summer, we continue to do tours throughout here, the City of Davis wetlands. So those are in person, they're capped at 20. So every single individual has to register on our website, yolobasin.org. If you go to um, guided tours of our wetlands, that tab um, under our, we have different program tabs. So you'll find it under there. Um, it's pretty easy to maneuver. And then there's a link that you just click register here, click it and then you sign up. Um, if you have, if you wanna bring out kids, the kids also, every individual has to be registered currently. Um, so we can cap it at 20 and keep everybody safe. Um, masks will be required for those in-person tours um, and we'll keep you spaced out. Um, it's both driving and walking tours. Uh, it's in, in one. So you drive the auto route, uh, both at Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area and here the City of Davis Wetlands. It's a driving tour. Um, here, uh, this site, it's a two hour because the auto tour, the hour route, auto route, excuse me, is shorter here than out in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area. Um, so it's two hours driving and then getting in and out of the car occasionally to walk around and explore. And our uh, volunteer tour docents interpret, just as I am today, what you're seeing live in the moment. Because um, we never know what we're going to see. So. I would just share with you what, what's out there with us that day, which is great. Um, so those are options for you. Um, and then in the fall, we'll get back into Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area tours in person. And we'll see where we are with our pandemic too and see if we can also provide more virtual opportunities for those of you that can't get out to the in-person tours yet uh, in the fall. Um, but you can also come out here on your own. Uh, you can drive the auto route. It's pretty simple to follow. There are signs. Um, out here, we've got some permanent water, permanent wetlands, and that's why we can do that throughout the summer here. Whereas in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area, we have a lot of temporary and seasonal wetlands that go dry. So then there's a, less to see. So that's why we stopped doing them in the summer. Um, but here, we still got stuff go more stuff going on. Um, but I encourage you to explore both sites. Um, there's a lot of beautiful plant life too. There's uh, mustard behind me. I know you're still looking at that heron, huh? I'm gonna come off the heron just for a little bit so you can see um, a little bit more of the area behind me. Um, but there's a lot of, there are willows out here. There are oaks. 
There's a lot of, there's a lot of tule and cattail. Um, and I'm actually following the beginning of the auto tour route as I move right now. So you're, as I move the camera, you're looking more and more east. And let's see, can you see those? Let's see if I'm at those buildings off to the side there. There are, there are some structures out there. Can you see some of those structures way out there? Uh, they might be too far for my camera. Um, but out that way is where you, you come up to a levee and um, you veer right on the auto tour to, to then go south. Um, and then you go back, it turns you back west and then you come back up north uh, to head back out of here. Um, any other questions? No more questions, Sabrina. More questions. I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to move the camera for a moment just so you can see that where we're standing, sorry about that, put my hand up there. Um, where we're standing, I'm going to just switch the camera view so you can look at what's on the other side of me, what I'm looking at. Where we're standing, there's a platform. And I'm just going to bring you down through the platform. So we're going to go for a little walk. So you're gonna go for a little walk with me. Are you ready? Sorry if it's a little jiggly, I'll do my best. And I just wanna show you that if you come out here and you walk where we're at, um, there's a platform and you might see my friend Nancy who's on scope out here. I'm going down the platform here and uh, we saw an otter here earlier. I might have some Thule hit the camera. It's uh, really grown up out here right now over the platform. You see all that tule that's sticking out in front of me? <laughs> I'm going through a tule maze. And uh, there's, do you see all that stuff on the platform? <laughs> that is otter scat. So uh, there's a family of otters that have turned this platform into basically their latrine. Um, and you can see there, there are feathers in that scat. See that? So the otters have been eating some some ducklings maybe, or some small birds, reeves possibly. Um, and then lots of crayfish, lots of crayfish uh, exoskeletons in their scat. So you might happen upon an otter out here too, which is awesome to see. So and this is where we're, where Nancy was kind of out here with the scope to look out on the water. Yeah, we do have a marsh run in the tule. Oh, I can see it. There's the marsh run in the tule. That'll be kind of our last thing to look at there. Our males make the nests. They make anywhere from 15 to 20 nests. You see it flying around in there in the tule. Um, and they make lots of nests so that uh, they can distract predators. The predators like raccoons don't know which one the eggs are in. They also do that to show off their skills because they're weavers. So they use their beak and their feet to weave um, their nests out of the tule and cattail materials out here. So we got a nice little quick look at the marsh run, which was pretty awesome. All right, so I'm standing out here in this maze of Thule on the platform. I just want to wrap it up. I just want to thank you all for joining us. I want to let you know we have some other opportunities coming up. Um, so uh, let's see, this weekend on Saturday, May 8th, we have a virtual vernal pool tour. And then also on May 19th and Wednesday in the evening, we have kind of a sunset time vernal pool tour. So different lighting and we see some different things. It is really drying up out there in the vernal pools. Um, and so we have a lot of great things to show you out there and then also complement with uh, photographs of what it looks like in an amazing wet, wetter year too, just like we have the photographs we use today. Um, so there's those opportunities. On May 11th, we have our last Vernal Pool Tour speaker series talk. We'll be hearing from a Vernal Pool expert and a botanist Carol with him about Vernal Pool plants. That's at 7 p.m. Uh, in the evening um, on, on Tuesday, May 11th. Um, our bat programs are starting up again for this summer. Those are very popular. They sell out so fast. 
And right now we can't take as many people as we normally could. So get on there May 15th, those tickets become available to you. We hope you can come out and see the bats fly out. We'll be caravanning out. We'll keep everybody safe and comfortable as we do that so we can see the bats fly out from the Yolo Causeway out in the Yolo Bypass Wildlife Area, the Mexican free tailed bats that is. And what an amazing thing to see. We have a talk that happens before that that's a virtual talk. Um, so it's a two-part program, it's hybrid, virtual talk, and then you come out to see the bats fly. Our summer camp programs are also now open. Uh, two of our in-person camps are already sold out. Uh, so get on our website if you have kids that wanna get out here or family members that have kids, they can get out here and explore the wetlands back again in person, hooray, right? It's so much better in person. And we appreciate you being here today with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you out here at the wetlands, both in the future virtually and in person again. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your beautiful day.